Welcome to our study this week of Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 through 15, and 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 14 to 22. My name is Scott Rainey. I serve with the Church of the Nazarene in the area of Nazarene Discipleship International, or NDI. This adult Sunday school video lesson is provided in collaboration between the Foundry Publishing and NDI. The Sunday school lesson is intended to support the local church's efforts to make disciples who make disciples. Please feel free to use this video in any way that helps your church or families. Last week, we began a new series of lessons on the church. We looked at a description of the first century church in Jerusalem from Acts chapter 2. We also studied the words of encouragement and exhortation from the Apostle Paul to the church in Ephesus found in Ephesians chapter 4. We noticed that the church developed patterns of worship, spiritual disciplines, and a commitment to spirit-led unity. This community of faith from the New Testament became an example to every generation that followed. This example still challenges Christ's church today. Such uncommon biblical living as described in the New Testament can be a great witness to the world today who desperately need faith, hope, and love. This week, as we continue to focus on the question of what is the church, we will look closely at the sacraments of the church, namely baptism and the Lord's Supper. The word sacrament comes from the Latin word sacramentum, meaning a sacred vow or an oath. Sacraments point to God's faithful love and commitment to his church. They are outward signs for the world to see what God has done inwardly by his grace. The sacraments are also a means by which we may encounter and experience God's transforming presence in our lives. For example, if you're inside a house and you want to encounter or experience the light of the sun, you had better go stand near a window. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are the windows of this illustration, ways of positioning ourselves to experience and encounter God in the present. The early church was rooted in the Jewish belief that the physical world is God's good gift. Galatians, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter one declares that God created all things and all things were created good. The physical body, therefore, was not evil in itself. This, of course, is why the perfect Holy Son of God, Jesus, was able to enter this world in bodily form as a baby in the flesh. This concept of God dwelling fully in Christ is where our passage for this week begins. Although the Apostle Paul was not personally responsible for planting the church in uh, Colossae, we, he wrote the letter to the Colossians in order to clarify how Christ's death alone made human salvation possible. In the middle of Colossians chapter 2, we have this rich teaching about the sacrament of baptism. So let's begin reading Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 through 15. Colossians 2, verses 9 through 15. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive 
with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing over them by the cross. In the words preceding Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, Paul was warning the church in Colossae to not be deceived by the fine-sounding arguments of certain unnamed false teachers, according to Colossians chapter 2, verse 4. We're not privy to the details here about what arguments were coming against the church. What we do know is that Paul dismissed any worldview or theology not based firmly and exclusively on the definitive revelation of God in Christ Jesus. Listen briefly to his claims about Christ. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, verse 3. In Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, verse 9. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness, verse 10. Think about the implications for us in Paul's words here. All the physical things God made in his creation were declared good. So the physical body is not evil, but good. Jesus, the perfect eternally existent son of God, came to us in physical body. God was fully present in Christ. So if we are in Christ and Christ is in us, we can live holy and complete lives. Christ's love for us completely fills us with God's presence and fulfills us as humans, enabling us to be all that God intended us to be. Paul makes a shift in verse 11 and begins to talk about circumcision. The physical mark of circumcision on every Jewish male was the sign of God's covenant with Israel. The rite was performed on weak old Jewish boys. It was the initiation, if you will, into the Jewish community. Gentiles, all non-Jews, were, refer were referred to as the uncircumcised. So for the Jews of the Old Testament, circumcision was a kind of sacrament, an outward sign of God's covenant love for his people. It was done once as an initiation into being Jewish. What is made clear throughout the Old Testament is that some Israelites were only God's people outwardly. Think physical circumcision. Inwardly, their hearts were far from God. They were not truly circumcised spiritually. This is how Paul said it in Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. Now, Paul reminds the Colossians that they had not been circumcised by merely human hands like the Jews had been. Instead, their hearts had been circumcised by Christ himself inwardly. Once again, Paul shifts topics in Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. This time he shifts from the Jewish initiation rite of circumcision to the Christian symbolism of baptism. Christ circumcises the hearts of his followers as depicted in the physical act of baptism. Baptism is a sacrament that, dis that declares we have joined the body of Christ in following Jesus. Like circumcision for the Jew, baptism is the initiation sacrament. 
a sign of radical reorientation of life, a change direction and purpose. In the manual of the Church of the Nazarene, Article of Faith number 12 states that we believe that Christian, that Christian baptism commanded by our Lord is a sacrament signifying acceptance of the benefits of the atonement and incorporation into the body of Christ. Baptism is a means of grace, proclaiming faith in Christ Jesus, our Savior. Baptism Sundays have always been my favorite day in the life of the church. There is something special in seeing new converts baptized that encourages the church like no other event. The sacrament of baptism contains beautiful symbolism. The new believer is brought into the water. He or she is lowered into a horizontal position to represent burial. The believer has died to sin and has been buried. Notice the stark finality to it. The believer has been buried. In the early days of the church, baptisms were often done in rivers. There's no magical power in the, in the water. The power is found only in Christ by his spirit. The body of the believer was brought under the water with the head upstream. The dem this demonstrated that the sins of the person had been washed away from head to toe. That same person then is symbolically resurrected from the dead into a new life in Christ as they are raised out of the water. Dead to sin, cleansed by the flowing blood of Jesus, and raised to new life in Christ. An important aspect of baptism is how it redefines our identity in relation to the community of disciples. Through baptism, we declare our identity with God's people as a part of our radical commitment to Christ. For many disciples, this identification came at the expense of other human relationships. Identification with God's family can even cost them their relationship with their biological family. This is still true in many places and cultures today. To truly follow Christ and become a part of his family is a profound an impactful decision and commitment. Baptism speaks of forgiveness, cleansing, and freedom, all benefits made through a, a, made available to us through Jesus. The Apostle Paul makes a final shift in Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. He speaks of divine forgiveness that canceled the charge of legal indebtedness. God canceled the debt of our sin and dismissed the case against us. In ancient warfare, conquering generals typically led their defeated foes in triumphal parades to deepen their humiliation. God's saving work in Christ defeated and disarmed the spiritual powers bent on human destruction. Baptism, in this sense, is a parade of victorious Christians whose sins have been forgiven, who have been resurrected in new life in Jesus. In the early church, new disciples were baptized after an intentional and rigorous process of teaching and spiritual practice. Worship services were divided into public and private sections. New believers disciples under discipline, and seekers could participate in the public service through the preaching. But they would not be, but they would be dismissed before the congregation celebrated the Lord's Supper. Typically, baptism, after the completion of the process of preparation, would take place early on Easter morning. After their baptism, they would enter into the worship service and for the first time see and participate in the Lord's Supper. This moves us in our lesson today from one sacrament to the other, from baptism to the Lord's Supper. If in baptism we start the journey with Christ, 
The sacrament of communion is God's provision for the journey. While baptism is typically a one-time event, the Lord's Supper is a recurring meal, a resource for God's family. To look closer at the sacrament of communion, let's move to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 14 to 22. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we uh, break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? Do I mean then that food sacrificed to an idol is anything or that an idol is anything? No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part of in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? The context of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 14 to 17, is about eating food sacrificed to idols at pagan temples. Paul knew that there is only one true God. And the so-called gods represented by idols did not exist. First Corinthians chapter eight, uh, verses verse eight, verse four. So since idols are not anything eternal, if food is sacrificed to them, it doesn't matter at all. He basically encourages a don't ask policy toward purchasing or eating food offered from an unbeliever, according to First Corinthians chapter ten, verse twenty-seven. Some believers, it seems, took this to the next step by attending pagan fest feasts. Again, since an idol was nothing, they reasoned, it certainly didn't matter if they attended and partook of the food there. Paul encouraged them to not do this. Instead, he said, flee from idolatry, verse 14. This is consistent with his command in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, to flee from sexual immorality. Since the two sins, idolatry and sexual immorality, always accompanied one another. Paul reasoned that participation at the pagan fe feasts would invite temptation and bring them into the danger of losing their salvation. Pagan religions knew nothing of exclusive loyalty to a single religion. In fact, most thought that practicing several religions simultaneously or sequentially made people more religious. Paul, however, insisted that sharing food at a common meal was an expression of com community solidarity and loyalty. It's impossible to be members of two different bodies at once. Christians who went to pagan festivals would participate in the idolatry by consuming the food at the sacrificial meal in the same way that Christians participate in Christ's blood and broken body during communion. So let's talk about the Lord's Supper for a moment today. The manual of the Church of the Nazarene in Article of Faith number 13 states, we believe that the communion supper instituted by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is a sacrament proclaiming his life, suffering, sacrificial death, resurrection, and the hope of his coming again. The Lord's Supper is a means of grace in which Christ is present by the Spirit. All are invited to participate by faith in Christ and be renewed in life, salvation, 
and in unity as the church. All are to come in reverent appreciation of its significance and by it show forth the Lord's death until he comes. Those who have faith in Christ and love for the saints are invited by Christ to participate as often as possible. The act of eating this meal, this special meal of the church, points to our continual feeding on the grace of Christ provided to us through the, cry, through the cross. We are spiritually nourished, renewed, and strengthened as we receive the signs of the body and blood of Christ. As in baptism, there's no magic in the elements or the rite we celebrate. The signs themselves are pretty meager, small portions of bread and drink, yet they signify a meal that is rich and abundant, a feast. God's grace in Christ fills us to overflowing. And like baptism, which connects us strongly with the body of Christ, so too the Lord's Supper. We do not partake of the meal alone, but in the body of Christ. Recently, I heard Dr. Eddie Estep, the DS of the Kansas City District, say of communion, he said this, I've been thinking about how we taste of the bread and the cup. We receive Christ into our bodies. But tonight, the richer symbolism, he said, is that Christ has taken us into his body. We have become his body, the church. So we partake of the Lord's Supper together. The sacraments and their frequent celebration are very important to the church. They point us to the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. They point us to God's covenantal love for his people. They guide us aligning our identity and values with the kingdom, preventing and correcting the drift that the world around us tries so hard to affect on the people of God. They serve to feed us, to enrich us, to bless us. So let us marvel in these sacraments, these physical symbols of God's love for us, his church. Let us participate and partake of them together in unity for his sake. Let us experience his presence through them as often as we have opportunity with the body of Christ.